Well, welcome to Cloud of Witnesses. My name is Robert Pears. In this episode, we're going to talk about the Zion years of the ministry and life of John Alexander Dowie. You know, he was a man, as I've said before, that came into Chicago in 1893 during the World Fair. Started at this small wood hut. Grew a phenomenal global ministry that by the mid-1890s um, had some very powerful buildings throughout Chicago and was really impacting Chicago. Uh, by 1899, you know, he's got places located throughout the whole of Chicago. He's got these home meetings um, really focused on the different communities. He's got his group of 70s, which are these group of evangelists that went door to door knocking and preaching the gospel. He is really taking Chicago by storm. And in 1899, he's got his eyes on something bigger. So as we enter this, Father, I just thank you for the anointing. I thank you, Father God, that you would just make sure we don't have a critical spirit, but Holy Ghost, open our eyes to see and ears to hear that we'd have a, uh, an understanding of what he did right and what he did wrong so that we do not, Father God, duplicate the wrong things, but we learn from the good things. And Father God, that we would fulfill our high purpose and in all things and all ways glorify you, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen. So in 1899, at the beginning, he's looking to this bigger vision. Now, I don't know fully where the Zion, Illinois idea came from. I do know that, for example, William Booth um, had launched in Darkest England, where he talks about these colonies, which of course are to deal with the issue of poverty. Um, you start to see Dowie talking about, and he refers initially to colonies. He's got a similar vision, but it's about the church. So there's a slight difference, but you see many similarities. These utopian societies that Dowie's going to build. He begins to look on the south side. He looks at uh, Blue Island. He looks around there. And then he finally finds land on the north side, 40 miles north of Chicago. Now, maybe it was because, of course, when he first came to Chicago, he stayed on the north side at West Springs, Western Springs, which is near Evanston today. I don't know. Um, but it was also located on a train line going to Milwaukee, which would also be important. So that was another thing. And it's right by the lake. It's a beautiful piece of land that was right by the lake, so there'd be beach access for the people. So in many ways, as Dowie's envisioning this thing, it looks really good. Um, Dowie is starting to change as we see, and it's a slow, gradual decline. He wants to hide his intentions, and so in the fall of 1899, he declares his war on, uh, his holy war. This holy war is attacking, and he calls it the attack on doctors, drugs, and devils. Well, you can imagine the attack of the medical community. He also attacks those, for example, Moody. Moody believed in medicine, and it said, so did R.A. Torrey. Now, Ray Torrey was a great divine healer, believer. He attacked Moody nonstop, and of course, Moody would die in December of 1899. R.A. Torrey went on to live to be an older man into the 1920s, I believe. But Dowie is becoming more and more critical. He now refers to himself as the messenger, and that really gives ample, amplified authority to what he's saying, you know, where He's starting to go back to the prophet of the Old Testament. And we must remember that the word says, you know, we're not in the Old Testament days, we're in New Testament, and that we're called to be sons and to be led individually by the Spirit of the living God. Not, and we must be careful that it's, we're not going back to an Old Testament mindset of this prophet um, where he carries or she carries absolute authority. Now, Dowie declares this war, and he actually starts his first campaign uh, at a new tabernacle they built on the west side of Chicago at Paulina and Madison, very close to the Rush Medical College. So needless to say, there was at this morning service a massive attack by them. They tried to create a, create a riot and stop the services. But Dowie's powerfully anointed, and he overcomes, and he's victorious, and it's a great meeting. That evening, he holds another powerful meeting on the north side at a new tabernacle built there on Lincoln Avenue, and I think it's Belladine. I think that's where it was. But Dowie's got a bigger vision. Um, he wants Zion, Illinois. And at, uh, at their New Year's Eve prayer meeting, as they pray in the New Year's, at the strike of midnight, the beginning of 1900, Dowie 
pulls back the screen and shows on a projector his vision for Zion, Illinois. And it's humongous. It's, it's incredible. You know, this society they're going to build to protect Christians so that believers can grow up in a world really being protected from sin so that your children will have such a godly environment so that they will be, become Christians. They will put laws against doctors and alcohol and smoking, all the evils that Dowie saw, and protect the people and keep them. Um, what a perfect world. He's going to have industries and everything else so people will have jobs. Uh, it's going to be great, and they get to see this beautiful picture of the Lamb. They actually were able to see, go visit Zion in February of 1900. Uh, as they began to really search out the land and look at the land. Soon construction began, uh, and one of the first things they began to work on, of course, was the Shiloh home. This would be the home of the Dowie family, a beautiful house uh, that we can show you the inside of. And I want to show you the, the, the ground floor just to get a sense of the beauty of this house. Uh, it's changed a lot today, but as we look at the first floor, you're going to see, of course, the dining room um, with this beautiful dining table um, and the, the, the furniture, the tables, the chairs to go with it. You'll also have seen the bookshelves. And of course, the bookshelves have uh, these little drawers that open up with steps because Dowie was a very small man. The total cost of all this furniture was 90000 Now, that doesn't sound, well, it sounds like a lot today, but in today's terms, it was about $2.5 million, just to give you an idea. The house was big enough that it had a servant's quarter. It also had a room for his bodyguard, Mr. Stern, and his wife, uh, whom he married. It then would have a room for the Dowies, of course, their master bedroom, with this beautiful bathroom that was done in the most modern way at that time period. Uh, then there would be a room for Esther. Esther wanted it done in a pink. She loved pink. And then there was Dowie's room. So there were lots of rooms. It was a beautiful, very beautiful house. It almost looked like the Stearns had an apartment of their own. Um, and the servants were in a back room of the stairwell that went into the kitchen um, so they could take care of the Dowie's. It had some very unique features. Um, it had this bench that was heated. So when you came in on a cold day, you could sit on the bench and be warmed. It had windows placed uh, conveniently to really help a draft flow so that in the summer you could help cool the place. So it was very well engineered. Zion itself was very well engineered. It was built on strong geometrical lines. It was drawn and designed from the get-go, unlike any other city. Um, he also believed in a strong sanitary system because he understood the importance of making sure that, you know, people lived a healthy lifestyle and that things were not uh, going to create sickness issues. So Dowie built, the, the, the basic plan was incredible. And in fact, many investors, we see this in the Chicago Tribune, talk about many people love to invest in it because Dowie has built an incredible empire very quickly. Uh, so why wouldn't you want to invest in this very successful man? You know, you look at some of the buildings he has, the equity that he has, it's, you know, and as a business perspective, he's continuing to build something and many people like the idea of investing. So now you can understand why many people were willing to come from all over the world to come and live in Zion, Illinois. But it'd be a frontier land. They were going to have to endure a lot of hardship, a lot of difficulty as they break open the land and build this new city. <clears throat> well, in the late 1890s, a man called Stevenson had come from England and he was a lace factory owner. Um, and he meets the Dowies and he's in awe of the Dowies. He, you know, makes an agreement with the Dowies. He falls in love with Dowie's sister, Mary, and they get married. Um, Gladstone was the best man and Esther was the bridesmaid. Um, and then there's an agreement put in place where Dowie will pay him, I think it was like 50,000 
um, cash up front and then 100,000 in bonds for him to move the lace factory over to Zion. It would create 50,000 jobs for the people there. So it's a great adventure. Dowie, at the beginning of 1900, goes on a world tour. He'd bought through this for many years. He now has his opportunity. And he goes on a world tour, and he's actually um, accompanied with Stevenson and his wife, Mary. Um, his wife, of course, goes along, and they go and they would visit Britain. And it's during the time in Britain that they actually would um, baptize Polly Wigglesworth and it's mentioned in the Leaves of Healing. During the trip, um, Stevenson's wife, Mary, Dowie's sister, becomes very ill, and they are forced to leave and return early. <clears throat> During the return trip, she actually died of pneumonia. So you can imagine Stevenson is a broken man. He is really devastated. And he's also having a great deal of difficulty in getting all the um, documents to bring over the factory and to bring over key personnel from that factory. So when Dowie returns, Dowie is not a happy man with him. And Dowie demands that he bring over more equipment. Well, Stevenson, you know, one of the things that happened, they had put this agreement in place, but Dowie changes it. Dowie begins to manipulate and change it. Uh, and this really would upset. In 1901, they would have a disagreement that ultimately caused Stevenson declare a breaching contract and he is kicked out by Dowie. Well, you can imagine the very quick fear of the Lord that people start to have as Dowie is, you know, exalted himself. And in 1901, he would also declare himself Elijah the Restorer. Um, they would lay the cornerstone in this year and do a lot of work in terms of building the tabernacle, uh, finishing the house and everything else. A lot of work is going on, but Dowie is now exalted himself. He is now Elijah the Restorer. And the vision is about building Zions worldwide to establish God's kingdom on earth so that Jesus could return. And that Dowie was the Elijah the Second sent forth to bring forth restoration on the earth. Dowie believes in the restoration of the gifts, but doesn't believe the people are ready for it. Um, and so, for example, particularly things like tongues, he doesn't believe the people are ready for it. And even though he does not receive or believe in the Pentecostal message, which is beginning to be preached in Zion, Illinois, Dowie opposes it. Um, Parham would actually preach in the Elijah Hospice, which they would build on Elijah Avenue, which is today North Sheridan. So a lot is going on, and Dowie is beginning to continue to decline. Um, this is the year, of course, where Stevenson would file a lawsuit against Dowie, and it's the first time that Dowie's, you know, control of the finances is exposed, and people want to look at the financial books. Dowie's taken complete control. By this point in time, Dowie um, owns everything, and he is taking for himself, um, let's say, to ninety thousand for the furniture, but he still it took sixty-five thousand to pay off a personal debt, which is about one point eight million give you an idea. Um, he was taking 85000 in a personal allowance every year, which is about $2.2 million. Him and his wife dress very finely. They live a very royal life. They are now rich. Um, there's beginning to see a rift between Dowie and his wife. Um, she buys all of her clothes from Paris. And um, she actually had a picture that she got from Paris. I mean, they like the best of the best. They definitely were not the Dowies of the years past. Dowie's not sleeping. Because all of his time and attention is focused on Zion, Illinois. He's lost sight of the original vision. And as I said, there's a very change in the man. Um, Dowie, you know, as you look at, um, he has this plan to build something even greater. He, he's constantly, he's going to build this initial tabernacle, but the design and thoughts of this greater tabernacle, a bigger house for himself, you know, everything inside of him, he wanted something bigger, something better. Um, there was not the humility and acceptance as there was early on. When we look at him during the, uh, the time of the healing homes, he would, through testimonies, spend time all day with the people, praying with them, ministering to them, and constantly reading and speaking the Word to them. Well, now what's he doing? All he's doing is focused on construction. The leaves of healing change. You know, the leaves of healing used to constantly have testimonies of people that were healed. And then Dowie would be defending and going through the arguments for divine healing, why it was your right and your privilege. 
Now today it's all about reruns and Dowie attacking things you know, the reformer spirit not consumed him where he felt obligated to attack everything. He also starts to get a little political and which parties and who you need to support. It truly is a dowry of a different time, a different mindset. Now, I'm not against, you know, people determining politically who they believe are right, but you're starting to see this very critical, very strongly outspoken dowry. I mean, he's gone to a different degree uh, than he was before. If you oppose dowry right now, he absolutely comes against you fully, guns loaded. I mean, the Leaves of Healing was a powerful tool for him just to attack you, to demoralize you, to just destroy you in any way that he could. Needless to say, as we go into 1902, Stevenson's case became before the judge and the judge ruled in his favor. And Dowie just went after that judge and after Stevenson, destroyed Stevenson. Um, even though Dowie had cheated him and manipulated him. And it's hard to understand how can people so easily have got manipulated. Well, the vision was big and you have to see Dowie slowly change and he was a really good, powerful man, but he's not there now. He still sees when he prays over people, people get healed. But the anointed protection that he had is starting to fade. Certain other things are starting to fade. And 1902 became another pivotal year. Uh, as I said, he's already declared that he is Elijah the prophet. And as we go into this year, at the beginning of the year, um, Arthur Clydeborn and his wife, Catherine, she was the daughter of William Booth. They left the Salvation Army. They had been serving the Salvation Army. I think she was like 10 years in France as the leader there. And she believed like her husband in divine healing. They were very fond of Dowie and wanted the freedom to preach that. At the same time, Bramwell, the, the oldest son, had taken over and he was very dictatorial. He removed them from France and uh, was just, they were not happy. And a lot of the children of the Booth family were not happy. And there was a real revolt in the family. So in January, they declared separation from the Salvation Army but, and wrote a letter, um, really stating to the father, look, I want a closer relationship with you. I just have to step away from the Salvation Army. It did not go well. Of course, they were kicked out and they joined the Zion family. And in May uh, of 1902, they visit, or I should say Clybourne visits the Dowie family. Now, um, John Alexander Dowie is in Zion, Illinois. He's away that day and he leaves Esther in charge. And Esther wants to look her best. So she gets a bottle of alcohol so she can use a curling iron, uh, heat it and curl her hair. But she doesn't want people to know. And so she locks the door and she begins curling her hair. Unfortunately, there's an accident where the um, alcohol spills, catches fire all over her. And she is extremely badly burnt by the time they're able to get in and rescue her. They call for Dow and he rushes back. But by the time he gets back, it's, it's really too late. She is so severely burnt. Um, he prays with her. And the, she says that the pain stopped, but she's lying there. And ultimately she dies, I think after two hours. One of the key leaders was a doctor. He checked her and he administered to her and basically said there was nothing they could do. It became a devastating moment in the Dowie family. Uh, Esther and his mother and her mother were very close. Uh, so you can imagine the rift between the Dowies grows. They would bury Esther in Zion, Illinois. She never did actually get to visit and stay in her room that was created for her. If you go and visit the Shiloh home today, they show in the room um, a lot of stuff from the person that gave birth to all the babies there um, and stuff like that. But the room is still there today.
this really would have been an opportunity time for Dowie to repent. And you can see that Dowie truly is broken by it. Um, and, and God was trying to reach this man. But Dowie continues to harden his heart. He is more and more consumed by this vision, which in his mind, he's serving the Lord. And it's amazing how easy the devil can get us caught up in something, distract us, and we deceive ourselves into thinking it's of the Lord. He's surrounded by yes men, and those that try to get in to give a word of correction weren't allowed. Dowie didn't receive correction, um, and he definitely didn't allow people to correct him around him. And slowly, many of those that opposed him start to leave the church. Well, again, 1902 uh, proved a continually bad year. Now, we start to see again more. They start to see the department store and other things. You know, Zion, Illinois is taking shape. Uh, They were finally able to move into the Shiloh home, a beautiful home. Uh, But things are clearly not going well. And then as we move into 1903, Dowie would actually disband his group of 70s. He now formed the Restoration Host. This host had to swear allegiance to Dowie um, and said Dowie has absolute control. He owns everything. He owns the homes. He owns the church. He owns the money. He owns everything. He owns the bank. He owns everything at this point. And this Restoration Dream, he plans this campaign where he's going to take his restoration message to New York and go to Madison Square Garden. And um, it's going to be very expensive, a very, very expensive venture. Uh, But everybody voluntarily should go. And of course, that meant everybody had to go. So they they rent out trains and the mass number are going to head to New York in October of 1903. It is also during this year that, you know, Zion has gone into almost bankruptcy. And many people are trying to fix things. They don't have money for supplies, they don't have money to pay the people wages. People are really starving, they're struggling. It is really a bleak time in Zion, Illinois. They can't buy the raw material to make things in the factory. They can't buy the cement to continue building. It is terrible. Um, And they work out a plan to help recover the thing, but you know, Dowie initially agrees, but then Dowie changes his mind because Dowie had to open up and let go of the one thing he should never have touched, finances. So it's not a good year. 1903 really was not a good year. And this Madison Square Garden campaign didn't help. It was a very expensive venture. But in Dowie's mind, he starts to look at that. He is going to increase um, people putting money in by building Zions elsewhere. And he's going to start thinking about really spreading the Zion message globally. And of course, this will get more investors and this will cover the financial problem that's going on right now. And as he looks forward, you know, he sees a glorious future for Zion where it will financially recover, but he can't let go of the finances. So in October, of course, they do the Madison Square Garden campaign. Uh, the building's flooded with people, but it is not a success. And Dowie doesn't have the same anointing. He's not as effective as he was in the 90s. He definitely is a changed man. He's no longer spending the hours in prayer and seeking the Lord and, and the Word. Um, he's now, everything's about this building. He's not sleeping for days at a time. One of the best ways to derail yourself is to lose sleep and stop focusing on the key things. So many heroes of faith Uh, one of the biggest things that caused him to slip was lack of sleep and not taking care of the physical body. And Dowie wasn't. So as we move into 1904, um, this is the year, of course, where Dowie would declare himself as the first apostle. He continues to elevate himself. We go back into uh, 1888, where he was asked, are you an apostle? And he says, I'm not low enough, I'm not humble enough, I'm not broken enough, I'm not this, you know. And really paints, paints this wonderful picture of an apostle. But now, he is the first apostle. He's lost the humility, the brokenness, and everything else, and that, you know, reverence that he had. He's lost the care for the people. Because the beginning of 1904, he also goes on a world tour, where he goes to various places. This is more money that the Zion simply does not have. He goes and he visits Australia. Well, he's just attacked um, the prince at the time, the King of England. And this did not go well in Australia. So his reception there was not very well. 
did not go very well. When he gets to Britain, again, it's not a very good reception. Some new pa newspaper said that no hotel would accept him uh, because he's now extremely critical. If you do not do the things the way he believes it, he just launched an attack against you. Um, and as I said, he's lost the care and burden for the people. And Zion, Illinois, struggling. He's on a world tour. When he returns, of course, there's a big fanfare and a big welcome back. Um, and the people at a concert put on a show to, you know, look like they're behind him and supporting him. And I think many people loved it because they remembered the Dowie of the 90s and hope that this will change and to see the burden on him for building Zion, Illinois. And at the same time, Dowie is amplifying himself to this higher position. So when he speaks, he carries more authority with it. And he's constantly trying to show the evils of the world and why he is the voice set to bring correction. I think that's why he got more and more critical because he felt as the restorer, as the first apostle, he was the salt and light on the earth and it was his responsibility by God to expose all wrong as he saw it. And, you know, he told people to follow Christ, as, sorry, follow him as he followed Christ. The problem was it was his interpretation of the scriptures. He was beginning to interpret it weird. Now he continued to preach the gospel and he never stopped preaching the true gospel but it's the add-ons into other stuff that he was getting into that became the problem. So it said he became the first apostle in 1904. Um, and again, Zion is in decline. Well, as we go into 1905, Dowie's now got a plan to build, as I said, Zion's elsewhere and get plantations where they could get supplies and stuff like that from. So he eyes this plantation in Mexico. He's going to go on a trip to Mexico and he's going to buy land there, spending more money that the people don't have. So he has this big meeting, um, I believe it was in April of 1905, and as he gets up to speak, he's struck with a stroke. And he's unable to move, he's in a bad state, and the people all wonder what's happening. It was another warning. You know, the judgments of God, when they come, they get stronger and stronger uh, because, you know, you're burning in the flesh to save the soul. So Dawi continues with his uh, son um, to go to Mexico uh, to look at this plantation. And then he spends time just trying to recover. He's very ill and doesn't return until Thanksgiving of 1905. Um, by that time, he's still not doing well. So he leaves again and goes on a second absence, believing that the warmer weather south will help him recover and he will be much better. But as we continue to see is that he can pray for others and get results, but he's not praying for himself. Now, some of the things I left out is he'd done a trip uh, in 1904, 1925. He'd done a trip to um, California. When he was in California, just to give you an understanding, the, the, the power this man did have in prayer, when he was in California, they were in a drought, and they said, well, if you're Elijah, make it rain. And he prayed, and it did rain. When he came back to, Ellen, when he came back to Illinois, to Zion, Illinois, they were in a drought, and he gets, he prays, and guess what? It rains then. So there, he's very powerful, very effective in praying for others, and so it helped amplify his claims that he was Elijah, he was the first apostle, and people saw that. But many, but many were getting to understand that this is not right. Many more ministries were raising flags of concern, and Dowie just started to attack them.
Well, while he was gone in 1905 into 190, sorry, 1905 into 1906, um, Volava, who was the leader in charge of Australia, returned. And he was very upset to see the financial situation that Zion, Illinois was in. Uh, and he and a group of the leaders decide to cast Dowie out. So Dowie, as no longer the leader of Zion, and he hears about it, and he is very, very upset. Um, he files lawsuits, and he rushes home. But of course, he's not well. He is not successful in his bid to regain control, but he is allowed to stay in the Shiloh home. Now realize they don't own anything. Dowie never planned for that. Now all of a sudden he doesn't own anything, but he gets to live in the Zion home, the, the, the Shiloh home. During this time, uh, Mrs. Dowie leaves and she goes and lives in Ben McDua, their holiday home that they had in Michigan, just south of Midland. Um, this is a place that they often go during the summer with some of the leaders to relax, refresh. It's hers and she claims it as hers and she's staying there. So during that last year, you know, the Gladstone, he now strongly opposes his dad, comes out against him, um, starts saying that his father was having an affair, and that his father was into pornography, everything to just really bring down Dowie. He does not like his dad. Now, to argue against it, the man was an invalid. Dowie was an invalid in a wheelchair. There's not a lot he can do. So it really doesn't support a lot of Gladstone's claims, and there was no real evidence to prove it. But Gladstone takes the side of his mother. And during this 1906 period of time, it's a very lonely time for Dow. He's on his own. He does get visitors. People do come to him um, and he is given some moderate help. But he's looking at now a city that is continuing to grow and develop, um, but he's no longer in charge of and he's not able to enjoy. So 1906 was a very difficult year. But, you know, we look at Dow, and I wanted to bring up again, this is a man that had prophesied, for example, the uh, coming of radio and television. He had had a powerful prophetic spirit about him as well. As we look into 1907, uh, beginning of that, Dow continues to decline. He actually fell over at one point when he was being moved, hit the ground, and the people picked him up. And they, they were just like, bro, because we, we dropped the guy, he's in a lot of pain. And Dowie is no longer focused on the pain, but on them. There's a change in Dowie. And those that visited him in the last few weeks said there really was a real dramatic change in him. He had returned to the man that he was um, and was a very caring guy and, and had a great love once again for the people. And unfortunately, on March 12, 9th, um, 1907, he went home. And um, it was sad because what could have been? Had Dowie stayed with the high call and the purpose of heaven, where Dowie could have been, would have been incredible. But unfortunately, because Dowie got lost, sidetracked in building his own kingdom and emperor, and you know what so many ministries do? They may not go to the degree that he does, but many, many ministries get caught in building their kingdom, their will, their purpose, and it's sad. And what Dowie had in Chicago, had he stayed true to the vision of Chicago, where would Chicago be today? He perhaps would have taken Chicago completely and the suburbs and won it for Christ. But Dowie, you know, was a man that there were flaws in him early on, that disappeared when he began really to get caught up with the Lord. But once he got sidetracked, those flaws came forth again, like the lack of controlled money, his anger issues. Dow is a great example of a man that there's things we can learn what he did right and a lot of the things that he did wrong. He truly was a man at that time period that was on every newspaper. He was a voice. Uh, and when he was flowing well, you know, you couldn't help. Everybody's voice, everybody that was thinking was talking either about Dowie or Zion or something because he was everywhere. He could have truly been a phenomenal voice for the gospel had he stayed with his message. Well, I pray as you look at him, not from a critical spirit, but from a spirit of humility, you will learn that this truly was a, a great man, a good man, but he truly derailed and did a lot of hurt, a lot of damage, um, as so many leaders do. And we must be so careful that we remain with a servant's heart, with a humility and love for the people that were to feed his sheep and we do not exalt ourselves, and that we stay with the true authority of the word, and don't surround ourselves with yes people, but people that truly can speak into our lives and bring a correction. 
Amen. Well, I pray that this has blessed you, encouraged you, strengthened you, edified you. Check out the series and check out other videos on the various heroes of faith and on the revivals of the path, past. And may they provoke you, stir you to step up to the plate and serve this generation as they did and to begin praying for a global awakening because we need it. Amen. Thank you in Jesus' name.